What is the largest swarm of insects ever, or at least that we've ever recorded? Well, if you follow me on Twitter or you know some of the things I'm interested in, you may have seen that recently uh, Radar uh, was looking at the skies over California and it found a giant swarm of ladybugs, or ladybirds if you're British, and I think it was 80 miles by 80 miles in area. Absolutely enormous, and it made me think, what is the largest insect swarm that we've ever recorded? Well, as far as I can tell, uh, the numbers may vary, but it's definitely a swarm of desert locusts. These hungry boys form in gigantic swarms, and they go um, from area to ever, area to area, devastating crops and vegetation. They're like a living plague. They, I mean, that's why they were one of the plagues biblically. Anyway, so uh, the way that these creatures actually move in swarms is cannibalism. So uh, we were trying to figure out, um, researchers looking at uh, collective movement, we're trying to figure out how these swarms actually form swarms. And I think one of the base levels that they got down to is that if you don't keep moving in the same direction that everyone else just happens to be moving in, the locust behind you will start they start nipping at your legs, and you could get injured, and then they will eat you. And that kind of weeds out uh, those creatures that aren't following the crowd. So that forms these giant swarms. Anyway. What is the largest swarm of desert locust ever recorded? Well, back in the 1950s, I think 1954, there were 50 swarms uh, that aerial reconnaissance picked up swarming over Kenya. 50 swarms. In total, these swarms of desert locusts uh, covered 1,000 square kilometers. And just from estimating the density of the insects in uh, per square kilometer, so how many, in, they're not, you know, shoulder to shoulder or you know, leg to leg. So how many insects were there in this huge area, like a thousand meters off the ground, a kilometer off the ground or so? Well, if you average it out, uh, it comes to about 50 billion, 50 billion desert locusts in these swarms. And together that weighed around 100,000 tons. So 100 million kilograms. The amount of flying locusts in these swarms in this year was twice the mass of the Titanic in the sky flying around place to place. Now, I should mention that these locusts weren't all flying at the same time. There were, there were different groups of them, and as one would take off, uh, one would land, so it's progressively like a little uh, a moving plague, so it's not all at once. but. With billions of insects inside, uh, with bi billions of insects uh, flying around inside the sky, which is a weird way to put it, we're all inside the sky right now, uh, it could take literally hours for a swarm to pass. With billions of insects, you could, you could start, oh, here they come, and it would just be a flood, a biblical plague of insects for hours as they pass, ruining all the crops as they went. So as far as we, we can think, the largest, uh, as far as we know and we have studied, the largest uh, swarms of insects have to be these desert locusts. I think the largest single swarm uh, was covered 200 square kilometers and had 10 billion insects in it. Woo! Now them's Them's a bug em. Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live edition of this channel where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and weird questions about bugs and other stuff, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. Look, I'm not a working scientist, I'm not an expert, but I do know a lot about uh, uh, some stuff, and I know a little bit about a lot of, <laughs> of sciencey and nerdy things. So if you have any questions that you want to ask me, I have Voice of the Void Nate here with me, who will be taking your questions from chat. If you spam chat, I will never, ever answer your question, but uh, get in there, get nerdy, and we see what we can, let's, let's see what we can tease from the yeah, Void this gonna week. Be, it's going to be a fun day. Oh, oh okay. Okay. From Red Fox 1562. Hello. How many times would you have to fire a gun downwards when falling out of a building to safely land, assuming unlimited ammo, 9mm, and terminal velocity? Oh, that's hard. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, basically, if you, if you fell out of a building 
and you fired something downwards, uh, you are talking about trying to stop yourself with the conservation of momentum. So um, the, the, let's try to simplify things here. So let's say um, that you are a person, and so you have some mass, and then you are going to be falling, of eventually stopping at some velocity we will call vt or terminal velocity now terminal velocity depends on your surface area um, uh, or what is falling through the air it depends on the density of the air it depends on your mass it depends on the gravity of the planet that you're on but basically terminal velocity is determined uh, by when the uh, drag force on you going up in our in our diagram here going up because you're falling through the air is equaled by the weight force how much gravity is pulling on you then you stop accelerating your acceleration goes to zero and you're at whatever final velocity whatever terminal velocity that is so now if you have a mass and some velocity what you are asking me uh, with some momentum is how much upwards momentum can we get from firing a gun with some mass and some velocity? Well, see now, here's the problem. The bullets themselves are what will be uh, giving us our momentum change. So when we fire, if this is our gun here, let's just draw ye oldie banana handgun here. So if we have a gun here, if we fire tiny bullets down, uh, they will have some smaller mass, but some much higher velocity. Let's just say M1V1. Anyway, so now, firing a bullet downwards at some velocity will give us some change in momentum, uh, some conservation of momentum that we can apply to this gun. So the gun, if it fires a bullet downwards at some velocity, it will want to move back at some velocity that will uh, keep this momentum constant, the conservation of momentum. This is what we call recoil, and we will be dealing with this in a future episode of Because Science, I think actually next week's episode, but this is recoil. So now what we're asking is, how, is there a gun that has enough recoil that we can keep firing down at the ground so that it will bring our momentum to zero by the time that we hit the ground? So, or, you know, a small amount so we don't smash into the ground with a high velocity. Uh, that is very hard to say. Uh, I, would have to, I would have to do some math because 9 millimeter bullets are not that heavy, you know, less than 15 grams, though they can fire very, very quickly, um, you know, hundreds of meters per second. Um, you, you'd have to do just a, uh, a balance, basically, of how many bullets you'd have to fire over time before you hit the ground based on what speed you're going. It's a complicated problem, but you can do it. You would just need to pick a mass and velocity for, uh, for the bullets you're firing specifically, and you'd have to get your own terminal velocity, and then, over, and then you'd have to determine over what time period you would want to slow down in without accelerating too quickly and before you hit the ground and then you have to pick your own fall height so it's complicated we can do it i cannot do this kind of thing off the top of my head although i wish i could for you but i'd probably screw something up i will say that there are guns that have uh, more recoil than they weigh and uh, randall monroe at xkcd in uh, what if uh, looked at this once if you want to go to his website um he he determined that the AK-47 has more recoil than it weighs. So if you pointed it straight down and you started firing the AK-47 remotely, it would start raising, rising up into the air. And if you put a bunch of them on a platform and fire them all at once, you could make like an AK-47 rocket and you could stand on it and raise into the sky. Now that sounds crazy, but if you think about it, that's all that rockets actually do. They just throw, um, excuse me, they throw fuel or exhaust downwards away from you an extremely high velocity which causes a recoil so to speak in the opposite direction which you just happen to be a part of and it raises you up into the stars so uh could you it, let me rephrase this using a nine millimeter uh firing at some velocity my gut tells me that no there's not enough momentum change here but is there a gun or some kind of weapon theoretically that could slow you down to the point where you could hit the ground safely because it has such a high recoil yes but also in those cases would the recoil be so much uh, that it would break your wrist or your shoulder or your ribs or or what have you so a uh, complicated topic depends on the variables that you pick what's next from mr marvelous uh, we'll see, based on your question. 
Hey Kyle, what would happen if we nuke the moon? <laughs> nuke the moon, baby! Um, the uh, interesting question. If we nuke the moon, the moon doesn't really have an atmosphere to speak of, so um, it wouldn't have the same outward appearance as a nuclear blast here on Earth because there's no air to absorb uh, all the uh, all the different radiation coming out, the thermal radiation, X-ray radiation uh, coming out from this immense explosion in just a few milliseconds. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not a nuclear expert, but I don't think you'd get the, anywhere near uh, the same kind of fireball um, that you would from a normal nuclear explosion. It depends on where you detonated the explosion, detonated the nuclear warhead as well. Um, if it was just on the surface of the moon, I imagine it would leave a big old crater. I don't think you'd crack it or anything. The moon's still pretty big. Um, I don't think you'd fling it out of its orbit. There's just not enough energy there, none of that kind of thing. I think you would definitely uh, see the marks of it, and it would, you know you can see craters on the moon uh, just from impact. So uh, it would it would damage the moon pretty good, but not catastrophically, and the explosion would look pretty different. I think uh, there's still there's still footage online, like on YouTube or whatever. You can look up test footage of exploding a nuclear bomb in space, and it looks totally different. You can look that up. It's a weird kind of flash, ethereal type thing. What's next? From James Bergsten. Oh, hello, James. Would you want to learn more about space or about our oceans? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's often said that we know uh, more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of our oceans. And I think that just has to do with the difficulty. I mean, you can send... You know, you can send an orbiter around the moon and or, you know, some kind of satellite or a robot or people, and you can map it fairly fairly easily. We've been to the moon. I'm, this is all relative. But going to the bottom of the ocean, which is a huge surface area, is very hard. And you need submersibles, which is kind of like an opposite spaceship. A submersible is a spaceship for the sea. I mean, there are two environments that you can't go into that have different pressures where you can't breathe. The ocean is, the ocean is for all intents and purposes, at the very bottom of it, like like the surface of the moon, in that you cannot leave your spacecraft and you have to explore it uh, very uh, carefully because of the pressure, because of the temperature, because of all these things, very inhospitable to life as we know it. So um, if I wanted to know more about one of them, I, to me, the moon is cool, but without the possibility, uh, we do not think that life exists on the moon. I don't think it's a very prevalent theory. It's 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 uh, drenched by solar radiation. It has no atmosphere. It has no magnetosphere. Um, it probably has no life on it. So uh, to me, the most important discovery that we're probably ever going to make is life somewhere else. And I think if, if it's not the moon, let's at least maybe try to discover some more of these so-called extremophiles in the bottom of the ocean, these, these uh, creatures that live near hydrothermal vents, for example that uh, look like things we've uh, never really seen before. They live in environments that we thought, you know, not tolerable for life, and they can teach us about life without sunlight, that kind of thing. Um, so I would want to explore the bottom of the world's oceans and see if we get to see a giant squid somewhere on the way down. Uh, also, just a heads up, uh, Dr. Moo is in the chat as well. Hey, Dr. Moo from Because Space. That last question would be a good question for Because Space. Hey, Dr. Moo. She doesn't have a question, does she? No. Okay, good. Don't she could, but... Don't, don't try to yet. stump me. <laughs> From Tyler R., you have a maintain question. Oh, wonder why. We all know you maintain your luscious locks, but uh, is there anything you, you do for your facial hair? Anything I do for my face? Oh, no, my face is a wasteland dog. Uh, <laughs> no, not really. I had, I, had bad, I had bad acne growing up, especially in high school. Kind of cleared up when I got older. I don't do much for my facial hair. Uh, I can't really. I don't think. I don't think there's much really you can do aside from just a uh, yieldy grooming every every once in a while. Make sure you don't look like a fool on camera. Uh, Got to shave that neck. Also, uh, you know my beard comes in pretty patchy, kind of like a Keanu Reeves kind of thing. So you know I'm not I'm not super stoked with it. Happier with my hair to be honest. Uh, speaking of Dr. Moo question. <laughs> yeah. From Dr. Moo. Nice transition. Hey, Dr. Moo. Would you live longer in space versus living on Earth? What? What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> uh, like in a habitat in space, I assume that you mean, or on a different planet? Uh, well, let's just say uh, on a spacecraft. I think right now, um, if you were on like a, a, a habitat out in space, maybe like a Ford Taurus kind of design, a Stanford Taurus. <laughs> no, Ford Taurus is a car. 
<laughs> a Stanford Taurus design, you know, a rotating space station that would give artificial gravity. Would you live longer? Um, I don't know. I think just as far as with technology as we know it right now, and for all the possible problems with space travel, living in partial microgravity sometimes, uh, getting just economically sorting out how to get enough materials up into a space station where any amount of any significant amount of people can live i think i think the challenges would be hard enough and you know there's radiation concerns there's probably long term effects of living in space that we haven't yet considered because we haven't had someone uh, in space for longer than you know a year or you know a little bit more than a year um, so it's hard to say i would imagine that life on earth the life expectancy is just greater because of all the possible things that could go wrong in an environment that we have not, relatively speaking, explored or tried to colonize all that much. So I think living in space is a, uh, is a harrowing prospect. We should figure out how to make our planet more habitable first. From Domir. Not, not going great on that front. Going some uh, Magic the Gathering. <laughs> you guys know my brand. Strongly. Kyle, have you looked at the Oathbreaker format yet? And what Planeswalker would you use when you played it? You sent me a tweet earlier, I believe. So Oathbreaker is kind of is like kind of like a form of commander. It's an alternate kind of it, it's an alternate form uh, format for Magic the Gathering, so not standard, not limited, where you're just opening booster packs and playing against your friends, not commander where you have a hundred card decks. Um, Oathbreaker, I believe you have a planeswalker and then uh, so you know one of these main characters and then a signature spell, so to speak. So you have access to two things all the time like you have access to your commander in a game of EDH. Um, I've never played Oathbreaker. I hear it's fun. Uh, if I were to do it, I would go with uh, Sarkin Unbroken, I believe, is the Timur uh, Planeswalker one. Uh, Sarkin, and then his signature spell would be... Uh, oh, Dragonstorm. Very on flavor, yeah. I would I would ramp up to multiple storm dra uh, dragon storm storm triggers, and then I would get them all out there. Then I'd beat face. What's next? From Captain Kitty. Yeah. What would happen if the sun's gravitational force stopped pulling on the Earth? If the sun's gravitational force stopped pulling on the Earth, uh, maybe I can do this s almost silently but that wouldn't be good for a stream. So let's say we have the sun at the center here, which is perfectly to scale. And we had, plan let's just say we have one planet. This is not to scale at all. Let's say this is the Earth, and the Earth is orbiting the sun. Now, we can kind of imagine gravity from the sun pulling on us as if we're on the end of some invisible long cosmic string. And the acceleration uh, due to uh, the sun's gravity is, pull is keeping us in a circle. And it's, it's like if you were holding a string with a ball attached to it and you started spinning the ball. What's keeping the ball moving in a circular motion is the tension in that string. Otherwise, it would fly off. So without the tension here from this gravitational pull from the sun, what the Earth would do if you just turned off gravity uh, eight minutes later, because the Earth is eight light minutes away, and information like uh, gravitation uh, or gravitational force um, gets transmitted at the speed of light. That's the fastest you can go. Once that happens, the Earth, according to physics and geometry, would fling off in a more or less perfectly straight line at a point tangent to the circle whenever that gravitational string was cut. And then all the planets would do this and just go, ah, in, point, in straight lines, tangent to a circle, and then fly off uh, into nothingness forever until it was captured by something else. And, and I think, I mean, there's a lot of cool uh, astronomy with captured stars, captured planets, uh, planets that may have been, for whatever cosmological reason, flung out of their solar system, then captured by the gravitation of another. So if this happened, we could be a so-called wandering Earth. What's next? From Donut one two one two one two. Ooh, uh, topical. What? It's donut Day, right? Yeah, National Donut Day. Yay! What's your favorite kind of bug? <laughs> Calories. Uh, 
My favorite kind of bug is the, this is oddly specific, but I don't know if this is the actual name for it. I never learned it. This is just what I called it as a kid. Uh, the zebra-striped uh, jumping spider. They're super tiny and they're oddly intelligent and they can jump really far for their tiny, tiny bodies. And they look like, uh, and they're perfectly zebra-striped and they look like the little tiny spider zebras. I love those little guys. You can move your finger around, they'll kind of like move around it and react to it like it's a thing, like they know. I like those little guys. I always try to find them when I was a kid. Um, jumping spiders are dope. Take that to the bank. From orangitis. Mm, sounds like a bad disease. Sounds like the opposite of scurvy. It's if you have scurvy and then you get too much vitamin C, then you got orangitis. Or gangrene. Do you get gangrene from? I'm saying it's colors, you know. Oh, okay. Would it be possible for a creature that could live on or in a gas giant. Would it be possible for a creature to live in something like Jupe Jupe or Jupiter um, for the uninitiated? Uh, well, Jupiter's um, atmosphere is crushing pressure. Um, we, we've tried to, I, was it Jupiter or Saturn that we sent a probe into and got crushed? Um, well, you know, we did it intentionally. But um, anyway, so there's, there's uh, a lot of very inhospitable conditions for life inside something like a gas giant. Could something theoretically deal with the massive pressures? I don't know, that's very hard to say. I mean, there are creatures on Earth that deal with many, many, many atmospheres worth of pressure. An atmosphere being 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level and for every 10 meters? I think for every 10 meters you go down uh, in the ocean, it increases one atmosphere. Something like that. So, um, so at the bottom of the ocean, which could be many kilometers deep, you can imagine it would be many, many atmospheres, dozens of atmospheres. So if, uh, there are creatures that can survive that. Could there be some kind of uh, creature acclimatized to the high pressures of something like a gas giant? It would move around it like the gas is, you know, almost like a kind of fluid that it's moving through? No idea. Uh, it would be fascinating to see what evolution by natural selection on a planet like that would produce, um, what kind of life form it would produce in conditions so harsh. I have no idea. Um, would it resemble, you know, these very almost uh, spirity like creatures at the bottom of the ocean that are very uh, delicate and if you try to bring them up, they just kind of disintegrate? No idea. I. Uh, Become a science fiction author and speculate about it. What's next? From Ale Cobain. Hello. How much radiation would it take to kill a person in seconds? Ooh, so maybe this is kind of like what we were talking with uh, Tony Stark. Uh, it's been, it's been like a month and a half, two months, whatever. So uh, uh, the so radiation, whether you're no matter what part of the electromagnetic spectrum you're talking about. Radiation uh, can, if, if there's enough energy in it, it can be bad. Let's just say that. So uh, how much radiation would it take to kill you? Well, if you're talking about something like nuclear radiation or like gamma ray, x-ray radiation, the weird thing is, is because, um, you know, it's light, and it's, it, it's light, you know, photons of light with different energies, unless it's particles like nuclear radiation, alpha and beta particles. No, okay, okay I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Radiation does weird things to the body. What it does mainly is ionize parts of the body, which can be uh, ripping electrons away from your atoms and molecules, which change how those atoms and molecules interact with each other inside the body. It effectively changes the chemistry of parts of your body, like your DNA. That DNA can undergo then uh, dangerous mutations, and then cancer can form, your organs can shut down. Uh, very bad things can happen. You can get confused, lethargic, get diarrhea as your intestinal uh, tissue sloughs off. A lot of bad stuff can happen. Um, usually the worst doses that we've ever seen someone get, uh, people don't die instantaneously. They die over the course of days. Like you can get a fatal dose or hours, whatever. Uh, you can get a fatal dose of radiation and still die a week later. Um, I think I've only heard of one situation where the radiation was so high that it could have killed someone instantly. And that's when uh, Anatoly, or is it Anatoly Berginsky? I'm, I'm totally butchering the name, but it was a, a Russian scientist who stuck his head inside the beam of a particle accelerator by accident. And it went like basically through his eye. 
and his head swolled up and his eye was weird, but he lived. Um, but I think they said that the energy of the particles in that beam, kind of like radiation, um, or like a particle beam, a matter beam, if you will, um, if that hit like something like his brain stem, it could have done enough damage quickly enough that it would have just dropped him. Um, so hard to say. In most cases where people are exposed to very, very high levels of radiation, they do not die instantaneously. It is more of disrupting enough of your body's chemistry and your organs that you have simultaneous organ failure, and then uh, that's the end of that. I don't know specifically what it would take to um, kill you instantaneously with radiation, but it would have to be an absurd number or, or very uh, directed radiation, like at, your, at a certain part of your brain, your brain stem, you know, your heart, it just, you know, just annihilates particles in your heart, something like that. Um, but I don't know of anything that does that, aside from, you know, directed particle beams and stuff and science fiction. What's next? From Bora Basar. Oh, hello, Bora. Is it possible to create after images in real life, or is it a thing of anime? Yeah, so uh, anime style after images, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's a trope in anime where I can move so fast that when I move to this other position, an after image of me still exists. And whether or not that exists in space or just in your eye and in your, in your perception is a weird thing you can get into with like Dragon Ball Z. But the, the, the core of the idea is that I can move so fast, an image of me stays around. And when you say it out loud, it kind of sounds paradoxical, right? Well, wouldn't you see even less of them if they were moving super fast and they would only blur if you can still kind of see them? Anyway, um, but this has been on my list for a while. It has a lot to do with human perception, uh, speed, how quickly our eyes move. And I, I, to be honest, I haven't quite sorted it out yet. My impression from what I've looked into so far is that um, if you move really, really fast, if you move so fast where you're just basically blinking from one place to another, human perception isn't fast enough to make it look like you can see a blur or see a, an image of a person left behind. Uh, I think maybe they'd want to do like a flash, like flash photography out can kind of leave um, residue, light residue, to use a weird metaphor, uh, on your eye. Maybe if they flashed before and then moved, like, ha-ha, and they flashed a camera and then they moved to another place, you'd be like, wait, wait, what, what was... Uh, so, after images are complicated, I'd have to look more into it. I think we have one more... One more question. One more question. From shirts till it hurts. What? Gr yeah. Like, put on so many shirts that it hurts? Yeah. Yeah. Would you have done anything differently when starting your YouTube channel? Hmm. Uh, I would have started it earlier. So uh, some of you may not know that we've been doing, uh, because science has a show, since 2014. So I've been doing it literally every single week, week after week. I don't think we missed a week uh, for the last five years straight. I think we're on episode 247, something like that. Um, so we've been doing it for a long, long time. So what I, would, what I uh, would have liked to do going back, I probably would have liked to start the spinoff, the, the actual channel part earlier, and we may have been doing even crazier things by now. Um, also, I probably would have wanted to look at at least one Khan Academy video and see that it's very close to what I decided to do. I don't know what, I, I don't, if I, if I had to go back and start all over, I do not know what iteration this kind of thing would take. Uh, I would uh, end up looking like, I just know that I, I'm, uh, when you love something, you want to tell the world about it. And for me, that's science and the universe and mathematics and physics. And no matter what this would end up to be, I'd still be doing something. I don't know what specific format it would be in, but I can assure you, oh, it'd be nerdy. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Because Science Live. Woo! Got another week down. Just another 10 years, and then we'll finally rest. I don't know. That's what the void says. Uh, so uh, thank you for watching me all this week. Thank you for joining us for footnotes and for the last uh, episode of Because Science all about whether or not you can vaporize Ant-Man with a magnifying glass. And for this live stream next week, new footnotes new live stream and new episode, a fun one about perhaps a movie coming out that same week. So uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Be nice to each other and remember, this is all we got. <laughs>